This is Living Waters of Grace, the teaching ministry of Clark Lawfer, Senior Pastor of Calvary Chapel of Westmoreland County of Greensburg, Pennsylvania. Now here's Pastor Clark as he continues teaching through God's Word. have no access to that anymore it's done right now even unbelievers are seeing mercy they're seeing the grace of God right now and we who believe are seeing it but there's going to come a day when those who do not believe will no longer have access to his forgiveness or access to his grace or his mercy that may be the worst part of judgment Every breath you breathe is God's grace at work. If you could see things from his perspective, you'd likely see many more specific examples of the way he protects and keeps you from events or paths that would lead you to destruction. In this moment, there's nothing you can do to exceed the limits of that grace. But as Pastor Lewis will warn in today's message, a day is coming when his grace will be retracted and only those who have accepted it will spend eternity with him. Now, here's Pastor Lewis in the book of 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 with today's edition of Living Waters of Grace. These are things that are evident or that should be evident in our own lives. We should have this this faith that should be growing. You know, and we and we do that by doing what we're doing today. We we're, we're in the Word of God, and we do it in prayer, and we're doing it through fellowship, and it allows our faith to grow, even in the midst of whatever problems are going on. It's a blessing that we can come here because outside of here, people are going nuts. They're looking for answers everywhere, and they don't have any solutions. They don't have any answers, and they're bouncing this way, they're bouncing that way. They're believing in this person, they're believing in that person. That uh, theology or that philosophy. It's everywhere out there. But when you come here and you're in the word of God, we here together help to encourage each other to keep on to keep on. And just keep on. Stay in the way. Stay in the word of God. Stay in prayer. Keep him number one. Trust in him. Trust in his word. And that's the three pillars that we have, that faith that that love but now we also have the patience what helps us to be able to do that is the fact that we have patience and that patience is because of the fact that we know we're anticipating the return of jesus christ this ain't going to last forever trouble doesn't last always we are going to have a time of rejoicing a time of reglorification we're going to have a time that we are going to be able to spend with the lord jesus christ this is not the end of the story for us This is not the end of the story. This is just the beginning of a great eternity that's going to happen when Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, comes back. Amen? And that's what we're hoping for. And that's the patience that they have. And they're waiting for that. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Second Titus 2, I'm I'm sorry, Titus 2.13. I just want to go there for a second. Titus I'm going to start right there, verse 11 to 11. It says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. That's what we're looking for. So we can be patient in the midst of all this. And that's why they were patient in the midst of it, because they were looking for the blessed hope of the return of their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So then we go to verse to verse five here. Now, verse five uh, is a verse that's kind of complicated. So we want to slow it down just a little bit. But it says here, which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. So what Paul is saying here is, you know, he he says the fact that you are going through these persecutions, the fact that you are going through these, these trials and these tribulations, and you're going through it with patience, that is visible evidence or visible proof 
of the righteous judgment of God. Now, some would say, well, wait a minute, if you're going through that, then is God really with you? If you're going through all that? That's the kind of doubt that the world likes to try to put in. You know, if you're going through all these problems and you're, on, you know, you're, you're, you're being oppressed and you're being, you know, persecuted, is God really with you? You sure he hasn't rejected you? The answer to that question is no. The answer to that question is no. Paul says the reason why you're going through it or the reason it's a blessing that you are going through it because as you go through that, that is the visible proof in the way that you endure it. The, your response to it is visible proof that God is righteous in making you worthy of the kingdom. This is what Paul is saying. He looks at it totally different. No, this is God making you. This is God saying that you are worthy of the kingdom. And you look at the old prophets. Jesus even taught about the old prophets. He said, look, and you go through those persecutions and all those things, rejoice. Rejoice. Because the prophets before you went through it. Because great is your reward in heaven. Great is your reward in heaven. Now, we're not saying here, this is not saying that suffering makes you worthy of heaven. And nor is it saying that we add anything to the finished work of Christ. That's not what we're saying. That's not what Paul is saying here at all. We don't add anything to what Christ already did with our suffering. You know, nor does our suffering make us deserving of heaven. It's not like we get brownie points because we suffer. That's not what Paul is saying here. But what Paul is saying is that the suffering brings out the proof or the evidence that God is working in you. That God is, that God's power is upon you. His, his grace is upon you. That you are able to endure it. And that's the, this is the visible evidence of that. Now that's not the, just the visible evidence to God. God already knows it. The evidence that we show, first of all, we show to ourselves that God is with us and helping us to get through it, but also to other people. They see it. And that's the testimony that gives glory to God. That's the testimony that gives glory to God. So the sufferings and the work, that's just God working through us. And he is the one that makes us worthy. It's by his grace that we are worthy. So endurance and suffering proves that God's judgment of them, the Thessalonian church, was right and shows their fitness for the kingdom. So in verse 6 now, he goes and says, since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you. Pay with tribulation those who trouble you. Uh, you know, the one thing we must understand, that it is a righteous judgment of God that he keeps his promises. He keeps his promises to the, to, to, to the, to the sinners, and he keeps his promises to the believers. I was always taught when I was younger that unrepentant sin is judged and faithfulness is rewarded. Now, we know that God is loving, because this is an issue that always comes up. But wait a minute, how can a righteous and loving God, you know, how can he send somebody to hell? How can he judge somebody that always comes up? Yes, God is loving. Yes, God is grace. God is merciful. But we also must look at God as being holy. God is righteous. And God is just. So Paul says it is a righteous thing with God to repay tribulation for those who trouble you. So those who are unrepentant sinners and who are troubling those who are believers, right now they may think they're on top of it, like they're ahead of the game. Like everything is going perfect for them. Everything is our way and nothing seems to be going your way. Boy, I wouldn't want to be you. I don't want to be you. You know, look at you, like, man, I don't want to live like that. Yeah, that's the way they feel now. But just like Lazarus and the rich man, the tables turned. And it got to the point where, in fact, Lazarus, you know, when Lazarus was, was in the world, he was a beggar. And the rich man had it all. He had it all. It was all going his way. Everything was according to him. But then when they both died and, 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 and had to go and see the Lord, the tables turned. Lazarus was the one that was receiving the good things. And it was the rich man that was dealing with the judgment and the torment. And this is, and Paul is saying that that's what's going to happen here. Those who trouble you, they are going to receive tribulation. They're going to receive trouble. But you, it's a righteous thing with God that for you, 
you are giving rest. You're giving rest with us. So Paul said we're all going to enjoy the rest of God. We're going to enjoy that, the rest with Jesus Christ. And that word rest here actually means relief or a release from trouble. It's a release from our labors, from persecution, from affliction. It's a turning of the tables. So we look forward to that. I can imagine, I can imagine that those who were back in the Thessalonian church who was going through all that persecution, they're probably waking up every day looking to see that, is my enemies dropped dead yet? Did they drop dead yet? Have they been judged yet? It's not quite going to happen that way. But when he returns, that's when they will see the judgment of God. When would this happen? When the Lord, you can see it here in verse, the bottom of verse 7, when it says, when the Lord is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, this fire that we talk about here, we see it so often in the word of God, and it represents always represents one of two things. Fire either represents the presence of God or represents the judgment of God. And usually where the believers are concerned, it represents the very presence or power of God. And that's why it was when a burning bush that Moses uh, was able to talk to God or God spoke to Moses through a burning bush. It was the presence of God. When they came on the mountain, that mountain would appear to be on fire, the smoke and the fire and the thunderings of the mountain. That was the presence of God. They were led by a pillar of fire at night because it was the presence of God. But then the judgment of God is for the unbelievers. Fire represents the judgment of God. We see that where the when, when Elijah called down fire from heaven and burned up the the uh, the, uh, 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 the 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 soldiers of the uh, king who wanted to do harm to Elijah, when the Lord burned up Sodom and Gomorrah with fire, so that 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 fire is like a judgment, but it also that fire is also a refining fire for us. And when we go into the fire or the Lord puts us into the fire, it refines us. It, 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 it tears off the bad things that we don't need and it keeps the very soul things, the, 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 the things that we do need. It, it, it strengthens those things in us. That too is done through the fire of God. So it's interesting because in some reports you see that it talks about the Lord coming with clouds and that's when we we who are looking forward to him coming you know that's us looking we see him coming in the clouds you know that's a that's for the believers to rejoice in but for the unbelievers they're going to see him coming in flaming fire because vengeance he's coming to put vengeance to strike vengeance on unbelievers he's coming with judgment he's coming with judgment uh, and, and he talks about two groups of people that he's going to be uh, distributing vengeance to. Those who do not know God, many believe that, are, that they are the Gentile unbelievers, those who do not know God. The Bible talks in several places of Gentiles as being those who do not know God. And also on those who do not obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that would be like your unbelieving Jews. They know God, but they're not obeying the gospel of God. They're not believing Jesus Christ as being the Messiah. So they, too, are going to be judged as well. Either way, for those of us who believe, it's going to be a glorious day. But for those of us who don't believe, it's going to be a horrific day. Either way. And then we go to verse 9. And in verse 9, he says there, you know, these shall be punished from everlasting destruction with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. And when you consider this statement, this may be the worst part of judgment. This may be the worst part of judgment, the separation from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, eternal separation. That means they are no longer have any access to his grace, they no longer have any access to his forgiven, his forgiveness. They no longer have any access to his mercy. They no longer have any access to any of those things, the power of God. They have no access to that anymore. It's done. 
Right now, even unbelievers are seeing mercy. They're seeing the grace of God right now. And we who believe are seeing it. But there's going to come a day when those who do not believe will no longer have access to his forgiveness or access to his grace or his mercy. That may be the worst part of judgment. And that's for eternity. That's for eternity. Right now, an unbeliever can repent and have access to not only God's grace, but his mercy, his forgiveness, and he can receive the kingdom of heaven. But there's going to come a time when that can't happen. That can't happen. So the consequences will be final. That may be the worst part of judgment, in my opinion. And then we go to verse 10. It says, when he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe, because our testimony among you was believed. Mm. So he's coming with, he's coming, he's going to return. And he's going to return. And for his saints, it's going to be glorious. Like we said, it's going to be a glorious day. He's going to be magnified by those of us who believe. That means he's going to be made larger and more evident. And they're going to see it in us. They're going to see it in us. I mean, God is never more glorified than when we can look at someone who is a trophy of his grace and his mercy. There are people in our neighborhood, and I'm probably one of them, thinking about it. Didn't think I was at that time. Thought I was okay. Now they probably talk about me like that, you know. But they probably thought, man, he was never, this, this guy ain't ever going to, so he ain't going to heaven. Ain't no heaven in him. You know, there are people that were just kind of crazy. They just kind of did some some outlandish things. And they thought, man, this guy is, this guy is through, you know. He's done. But then God starts working in his heart. And you see him again. And it's like, oh, my God, what happened? He speaks in a way that makes sense. He's no longer doing things that are crazy. He's dressed in a way that just looks like he's civil. I mean, it just, like, what happened? And we saw an example of that when the demonics, you know, when, when Jesus went before the demonics, the whole town looked at this guy. They were afraid of him. They were afraid of him. They didn't want to walk by him. But then when Jesus got a hold to him, they saw him sitting beside Jesus, and they couldn't even believe it was the same person. That's the glory of God. And he's going to do that with so many people in that day. We are going to be the ones to show glory. It's going to be in us. We're going to glorify. He's going to be glorified in us. So we believers are those who reflect his glory and not those who have rejected his glory. By rejecting his son, Jesus Christ. In John 17, he says, you know, yours are mine and mine are yours. And I am glorified in them. Jesus says, I am glorified in them. And then he's going to be, you know, then we're going to look at him and be marveled. The Bible says that we're going to, add, you know, he's going to be admired among all of those who believe. We're going to look at him and be astonished. And we're going to be, we're going to marvel at his presence. We're going to just marvel. We're going to be in awe of his presence. Can you imagine just seeing him? I can't wait to see him. Can't wait to see him. Can't wait to see his face. We're going to marvel in his presence. Now, those who don't believe, they're going to be running from his presence. He's going to marvel. We're going to marvel at his presence. Then in verses, we're about to finish up here, verses 11 and 12. It says, therefore, we also pray always for you. That our God would count you worthy of his calling and fulfill all the goodness, all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. Let's just stop there for a second. So the goodness of God is what they're talking about here. Now, he says you're going to be, you know, he says that, you know, God would count. I'm praying that God would count you worthy of his calling. That means that God would declare or decree you worthy of. Of his calling that God's power is working in you and as a result of that you are going to be countered considered decreed declared worthy of his calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness now the Bible talks in many places about walking worthy of his calling we can't do that on our own we can't do that on our own we blow it we blow it 
But we do know that God is able to make us worthy. He's able to, he's able to work in us in a way that we will live a life that's worthy of his calling. And he says, and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness. And, and it's interesting, when you look at the good pleasure of his, of his goodness, it's not just doing good things. It's not just doing good things. But it's doing good things with a good motive. And that motive is pleasing the Lord Jesus Christ. Not pleasing a man. Not trying to position yourself. Not trying to weaken someone by doing something good for them. So you weaken them to an opportunity to take advantage of them later. That's not what this is talking about. This is talking about doing good with good motives. It's good motives. The meditations of my heart. And the words of my mouth, okay, are both pleasing to God. Not just me flattering you with my words, trying to butter you up to weaken you so that I can take advantage of you or so that I could be given a a special favor or whatever it is that we may want to gain with our plan to butter up or flatter. But this is actually living, living it. And having it in our hearts to do that which is good. And again, that only comes through the Spirit. We can't do that ourselves. That comes through the Spirit of God. All this is a grace of God. It goes back to the earlier, that earlier word of grace. All this is a grace of God. To do good things is a grace of God. And then verse, and then, then we, you know, we finish up with this. The reason why in verse 12 is that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified. That's why he's praying that for them, so that the name of the Lord Jesus Christ will be glorified in them and you in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the grace of God that saves us. It's the grace of God that keeps us. It's the grace of God that causes us to be able to stand under persecution. It was the grace of God that caused this church to be able to stand in the tough days. It's the grace of God. And it's the grace of God that's holding us even now. It holds us. And it holds those who are not saved. So I just want to say to those who are listening, if there's someone here today that have not given their life to Christ, you've thought about it. Maybe you've heard things, saw things that begin to pull at your heart. And you said, maybe tomorrow. Maybe tomorrow. Maybe the next day. Maybe when I get older. I'm not quite ready yet. Brothers, sisters, we don't know when that last opportunity comes. We don't know. It may be within the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Or it could be within the next five minutes that we leave here and go to be with our Lord Jesus Christ. We don't know. People are leaving here every day. And they're not all going to be with the Lord. So I plead with you. I beg you. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Repent for your sin. Repent. He is a good God. He is willing and he is able to forgive you and to cleanse you of everything you've ever done. Make you new. Repent today. Turn your heart to him today. Turn from that wicked way and trust him for your salvation. Do it today. Don't wait till tomorrow. Do it today. He's ready and he's willing to receive you. His arms are open wide. He's ready to receive you. But there will be a day when it's going to be too late. Let that not be today. Don't tempt that faith. Don't test it. You've been listening to Living Waters of Grace. He wanted you to be aware that this message was given by Pastor Lewis Harrell, an associate pastor serving alongside Pastor Clark. Although you're familiar with Pastor Clark being the voice of Living Waters of Grace, you'll now have the opportunity to hear both pastors on this program. Pastor Lewis is making his way through 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. These books are a constant reminder of the blessings that await faithful followers, but this was often difficult for such young believers. 2nd Thessalonians 2.3 says, Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. 
When you choose to remain faithful to God, the one who is always faithful to you, it comes with its own reward. The new church in Thessalonica was thriving, but Paul correctly saw the need to reinforce God's steadfast love and identify him as a promise keeper. Paul's second letter reads like a response to questions the new church was struggling to answer. Living Waters of Grace is a ministry out of Calvary Chapel, Westmoreland, located in Greensburg, Pennsylvania. Are you in the area? We would love to continue learning more about life in Christ together with you. Stop in and see us this Sunday morning at 10.30 a.m. When you do, be sure to mention that you heard us here. We'd love to hear the stories of how God is using this program to reach people. To find out more about the church and get our location, head on over to calvarychapelonline.com. Thanks for joining us today on Living Waters of Grace.